people of the internet, it's your guy, it's your dude, it's your boy, Alex Coons, and I'm sitting here at Hot Tongue Pizza to bring you this brand new episode of Pie to Pie. Man, Chris Wallace from Ozzy's Pizza has had a crazy year since we sat down with him last we just pretty much unpack the year that he had. Chris's trajectory at uh, Aussies was straight to the moon. Dude was shooting for the stars and went to Mars. When we caught up with Chris the first time, he was cooking just a couple days a week out of an underground bar called Underdogs in Glendale, which he has now moved to a very big outdoor kitchen situation uh, at the Glen Arden Club. But Chris went from a busy night being 80 pies, which is a busy ass night and selling out to pushing close to 400 pies a night. Dude is doing 2000 dough balls. He literally had to times his staff by four. His business exploded. He had to buy another oven. And somebody who comes up quite a bit, Dave Portnoy, love him or hate him. Chris got an insane review from him. And what it did for his business was truly out of this world. There were other things that were already pushing Chris's business to the next level. And we really talk about what it takes when those opportunities come and what comes after that. We talk about a golden ticket and you can get a golden ticket, but you also have to be prepared for what comes after. To quote another very famous Chris Wallace, mo money, mo problems. And that is exactly the truth. You wish for success, but what you do with it when it knocks on your door is really gonna show who you really are. Sometimes as a small business owner, somebody that's been in the game for as long as I have, it's tough sometimes to see somebody who has been in the game for such a short time, have so much commercial success right out the gate. But Chris is very deserving of all the success that he has had. You still have to make good product, you have to show up, you have to get wait times down, you have to create policy, you have to keep create processes, and most people have years to figure that out. Chris had weeks, and we talk about all of that. Everyone struggles with different things, and outside of pizza, life is a struggle, and it's just how do you show up? How do you figure things out? Just sitting down and listening to Chris, he has been through a lot. And this crazy motherfucker is opening up a pizzeria thousands of miles away because he is not afraid to fail. He says it multiple times in the episode. There is a lot of beauty in that. I tell a story about Chris not giving a fuck about what other people think. That is a superpower. Do not worry about what other people think. And I know that this episode is really going to resonate with a lot of people. The story is incredible and I hope you're inspired. I know that Dave Portnoy is a hot topic and that he comes with a lot of, uh, I don't know if the word is baggage, but I just want everyone to know that this is a pizza podcast. And what this man does for businesses is something that you cannot deny. I'm not trying to have a debate about Dave Portnoy's personal choices. I think it's worth saying that when we talk about Dave Portnoy, it's through a pizza lens. It is what we were doing here. We were talking about business. If you want to have debates about Dave Portnoy, feel free to, uh, you know, drop it in the comments here. Just go wild. If you're looking to really elevate your life, and and have a productive day then stay out of the comment section go take a hike anyways to wrap it up it was wonderful having chris back on the pod it was a beautiful day in glendale and we were outside it was a great ass conversation chris i love you ozzy i love you i gotta say you know give me fuel give me fire give me that which i desire sleep with one eye open metallica forever before we start the pod, I want to shout out our sponsor, Zabs. Zabs is incredible. Both their hot sauce sit on every table at Hot Tongue. Their St. Augustine and original are mind bending. I'm talking naturally sweet heat and their signature slow burn. They got this secret pepper from Florida called the Dot Teal 
It is hot, it is sweet, it is perfect on pizza, on eggs, on anything. And I know that anyone who tries it is gonna love it. If you don't know about Zaps, you gotta check them out. And you know who put me on their hot honey, which I think is better than all of them? Nick Camacho. Shout out the man, the myth, and the legend for putting me on this. I didn't even like hot honey before this, but Zabs changed my mind. I wouldn't put it on every table at Hot Tongue if I didn't believe in how much it could enhance pizza. Do yourself a favor and go check out Zabs. You will not be disappointed. Anyways, I'll stop talking now. Let's get to the pod. Let's go. I think this is good opportunity that you've brought Ozzy along so that everyone knows that this is Ozzy and it, you are Chris Wallace. My name is Chris Wallace and I am a human man that owns Ozzy's Abits. This is Ozzy. He's a dog. He owns everything that I do, but there is a separate person. It makes me laugh though now because like people are like, hey Ozzy, I'm like, sure, like whatever. But, uh, yeah, do you even try to fight it anymore when people come and say hi to you? All. Or Well, for the longest time, it was like, what do you think the dog is on the logo? Because there's just a random, his head on the logo. Yeah. And people would be like, oh, I just thought it was like a cute dog. I'm like, no, I get that. But I'm asking you, like, what do you think why he's in all the branding? Or who is that? But I get it. I mean, everyone has their own different thing. I know Zabs does his thing, but Zabs is his dog's in his logo. Yeah. And it's like... I don't mind it. It's just really funny. Because, like, when I'm at – I was at the Kings game a few uh, weeks back, mm -hmm. and I sat down with uh, my buddy, and I'm like, oh, this would be great. A night off from the shop, get to watch the game. I literally sit down, and right behind me I hear, yo, Ozzy! Ozzy! And I turn around, it's like 10 of my customers were in the row behind me randomly. And they're like, that's Ozzy, that's the pizza guy. I was like, yeah. That's me. Whatever. Yeah. Christopher Ozzy Wallace. Just accept it. He's being good today, too. He's happy to get out of the house. Well, he's ready. He is dressed. He's got a bow tie on today. Yep, he picked it. That's my stupid dad joke every time. He looks good. He looks great. Um, a lot has changed since I talked to you just a little over a year ago. Yeah, I dude. talked to you, and we were at Underdogs mm -hmm. and by the Americana. If you don't know where that's at, it's a great mall that my wife loves to visit in Los Angeles. Let me Actually, guess, on in Saturdays in the middle of the afternoon? Oh, uh, well, she would, she would go any day, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is not the day to go. No. Uh, beautiful mall, uh, but much has changed. You're now here at Glen Arden Club. Yes, yes. Um, but, uh, you know, you had a trajectory when I met you. You, you have... You've always had high energy. Uh, David himself said when he met you, you had cocaine energy. It's true. Uh, but you've done a lot. You want to just you just want to take me through it and. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I have my monster in front of me, so I'm coked out right now. So let's go. Yeah, man, um, I can ask you questions as you go. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm glad we're chatting because like, there's been a lot of change to Aussies and my life in just the last three months but since we talked that was over a year ago yeah and just from there to now like my life like I, I have the greatest life possible and I'm so grateful for it and like it all started because of your podcast with me and like just being able to talk about our story and you know I got that was the first day I met you in person yeah you remember that yeah, yeah you right there you put me in that elevator the freight elevator. Yeah, that I was like, it would, might work. Yeah. <laughs> Come on downstairs. Don't tell anyone you're here. Yeah. We're going to be fine. Yep. I remember the underdog staff didn't even give a shit. They're just like you putting did, beers yeah, away <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> we had to ask for them to turn the music down. They're like, oh, but what about customers? It's like, I, we're, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, it worked uh, out. It actually looks, it, it looked real nice. It's a there. great video, man. You yeah. shot it beautifully. And it was, that was a fun, Thanks. That fun had, chat. I did all of that. Yeah. That there was, was nothing me. to do with this guy no. behind the scenes at no. all. No. Matt no. doesn't get enough credit. Dude, give up, Matt, come in here. Yeah. <laughs> give him the credit. <laughs> Matt, Matt's making his way a little bit on more and more pods, you know? He, he just gradually walks yeah. behind him. My yeah, just doing a couple, just holds uh, a sign like a ring girl, yeah. hashtag Matt. Yeah. And I it's think like, we need to get him a mic. I oh, think that's dude. the next move. Dude, that would be wonderful. Just yeah. to like chime in every now and yeah. then. A little yeah. Steve-O action. Just mm -hmm. be like, hey, what's up? You yeah. Know? He's got gems to drop. Sometimes better questions. We had than a great chat when we were at dinner at the expo. We sat next to each other and we were we were joking around all night. He's a good dude. Yeah. I like Matt a lot. It's fun to have a right hand man in this because I used to do content by myself all the time with yeah. him during COVID. Dude, the grind mm -hmm. to like edit yourself and 
think of ideas and not have a support system is like so fucking hard. Yeah. And like soul draining sometimes. So like the fact you have him is like beautiful. It's a great thing. I literally do nothing. No, you All just I do, up. I seriously just open my mouth. Dude, Alex Kuhn's life is pretty simple. He wakes up around 3 p.m. every day. Uh, he calls his shop. Hey, you guys there? Good. All right, I'll see you in a week. I'm going to Cancun. Someone want to watch my kid for me? Oh, man, I haven't seen my kid in three weeks. He's been with the nanny. Yeah, he's know. like he's like 10 years old now, yeah, randomly. Yeah, I think so. He, yeah. They grow up so quick when you're not I there. I love your son. The first time I met him, he ran up to me and goes, hi, and just gives me a giant hug. I know, that was awesome. Yeah, I love your boy and your boy. I mean, the best part is now that we're, like, good friends now, it's fun that, that we could just chat, like, on your podcast. But since then, like, that's the thing. Like, our, our community out here in LA has grown so much since you started pie to pie. Yes. And like just over the last year, year and a half trajectory, like we all have our things now. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I remember last year at this time, I, uh, we were, again, we're at underdogs. We're doing like two nights a week. I still have my full-time job in sales mm -hmm. and that was it. And then everyone else, like little dynamite hadn't opened up their shop yet. Yep. The former bootleg. And then I became friends with them, uh, became friends with you. Lasorda's. I hadn't met Tommy yet. At that point, who's become just a gem of a human in my life and your life, too. Yeah. Like, it's just crazy to think, like, that's why I love when people are like, why is L.A., like, really as fun as it is? Like, do people, like, get along? Like, yeah. Like, we're a bunch of misfits who just make pizza and, like, we just joke about it. Yeah. It's the best part. Like, yeah. it's just camaraderie. It's wonderful. We all help each other out, which is, you know, that's the best part. When we went through all of our craziness the last few months, you know, one night I ran out of pepperoni and I, like, texting all the boys, like, anybody like that's the craziness we'll get into, but like it just being able to have that lifeline with everyone. Mm -hmm. Like I never would have thought that would happen, but it's basically because we're all just so genuine in who we are and like what we do. Like we all just get along, and it's great. And if you suck, we just you know we test you. We send David Turkel at, after you. Shout out LOL Caesars, and he'll just rip you apart, limb from limb, digitally. Oh no, the trajectory has been nuts. Like so, we did that interview last year and. It was awesome. Like just being able to at the time I was so happy I get to make pizza two days a week in my small like upstart like side business at the time. And it was always a side hustle that I wanted to make my full time life. But, you know, like restaurant ownership's hard funding and figuring it out and all that and just growing. But at the time it was just me and my business partner, Craig, and that was it. And we were growing. And then we had that eater article, which was really cool that Farley wrote for us that like let people know about us, which was great. And then Matthew Kang wrote some stuff about us, which was wonderful. And we got in like all those lists. Like there's always a list that comes out every like three or four months with these L.A. based um, food magazines. Like we were getting them. I'm like, that's this is amazing. Yeah. Like the sheer factor being recognized for doing a style that we still get flack for because it's like it, New Haven. Now it's well, I'll get into it. But before it was like New Haven. What's that? out here in LA. Now it's like, well, it's not really New Haven if it's not having the coal and all. And I'm just, it, it, there's so many funny th things we could talk about that have happened. Yeah. But like, yeah, we, we were in underdogs and what was happening was the building got sold. So like on a Monday, I get a text from my, my business partner who's doing dough and he's like, I can't get in the door. I don't know what's going on. And then I get a call. Hey, the bar's been sold, but before you go look for real estate, like we have an opportunity for you to, to move like very quickly and have like a full-time pizzeria set up at Glen Arden Club. And I was like, great, what is that? Like I didn't, like they had talked about it with me, but we didn't discuss where it was or anything. So where we are now is only about a mile from our old spot at Underdogs. Yeah. And to give you some perspective, like Underdogs was, we shared a kitchen in, a, in a, an underground sports bar. And then I come here and I remember I walked into the patio here and I saw the wood, the woodstone oven from a distance. And I was like, okay, we have an oven. We can make pizza, so let's just figure this out. And then, you know, gratefully to the ownership team at Glen Arden Club and everyone that supported us, they we were able to get a, a fully licensed kitchen, and uh, the oven was already ready to go, and we got everything set up within two weeks. But the part of the deal was, hey, we need you to be here five nights a week. And I was like, great, but I have a full-time job. And they're like, yeah, we need you five nights a week. And I was like, all right. Like, because I'm insane. I will just risk anything for this thing. Yeah. So I was like, all right, five nights a week. Maybe I'll hire a person. We'll figure it out. So we did grand opening in July of last year, and it was just me, Milton, who is now a legend in the L.A. pizza scene, our, our customer who never made a pizza in his life, who's now like our oven trainer and like one of the greatest humans I've ever met. I know you know him. Like he's just 
such a good person. Yeah. So we hire him. So it's three people. And then my uh, one of my co-investors, Becca, who's a friend, was our uh, front of house just doing register. And I remember that night we were like so excited. We sold out of 80 pizzas. And I was like, wow, that was insane. Like in like three hours we sold out. Now we know what we can do and everything. Then a week later, we got a 20 quart Hobart so we can up production. And we were just nighttime service Wednesday through Sunday. And we just started going. And then it was just gradually building. Like I was able to get payroll started, hire two more people full time. And it was just the five of us. Like we're just kind of making pizza and building up our thing. And many, many nights here where I just sat here waiting for the next order. And I I, I don't want to pay for marketing like ever. I don't want to pay an influencer ever for anything. So it was just like, I'll do Instagram. I'll do um, as much of that as possible because I learned from you. Like I learned from like the people that were doing it before me, just be yourself make funny reels, like post stuff that about Ozzy, post stuff about pizza and like, it'll get out there. So we had great word of mouth for the first four or five months. And then we'll get into the whole Portnoy effect thing. So November 1st, I was able to finally quit my day job. We talked about that on the round table. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I put in my notice and my company, I used to work for Giant Kombucha, was always super supportive of this, but obviously there was a breaking point where I'm working a hundred hours a week doing both. Like I was falling asleep in my car on the side of the road during the day. Like I was getting burnt the fuck out. Yeah. And because at the time I'm the only pizza maker with the, with the skill set to make them as fast as we needed it. Yeah. And I was training Milton and Craig to do it more, but it was just hard, you know, to let go, you know, like every pizza shop owner, that's the chef knows it's so hard to like, just let that part go a little bit. So then I put my notice in and my company was so great. They're like, we'll give you a month instead of a two week, like, Grace period, we'll give you a month to get everything situated. I was like, a month? And like my boss, Chris Griffin, best guy in the world, was like, dude, take a month, you got this. Like, I believe in you, like, you know, it's gonna be great. So November 1st, I quit officially and then moved on. And then November like 2nd, we opened for lunch because now I can do lunchtime. Yep. And those days were interesting because people would come by like, we didn't know you were here. And I was like, well, now you do. (laughs) We're here. (laughs) We're here now, hi. (laughs) Ozzy's a pizza, he's a dog, not me, how you doing? It's kind of, it's not burnt. It's just charred. What do you want? But uh, that week I was able to finally afford signs. So we got great signage now on the side of the building yep. and in the front. We did a big campaign of, uh, you know, opening for lunch and it was going great. Yeah. Like, and I, and I did the finances in my head, like, okay, if we could do this amount every week and grow gradually, I could be, you know, comfortable paying bills and, you know, all that stuff with the staff I had. And come Christmas time, we were going to close for the whole week just to give everyone a break. But I don't know why. I was just like, we can't close for that long. Like, let's just close for Christmas. And I'll, I ended my trip early and I flew back from Connecticut. And I was like, I'll just, I'll run the shop with uh, the staff we had. And like, it'll be fine. Even if it's slow, it's New Year's Eve. We'll probably get some sales for parties and stuff and it'll be good. And then I'm, I'm at the airport and I see that Dave Portnoy posts that he's going to Pasadena for the Rose Bowl. I was like, oh man, he's in town. Yes, he loves New Haven style. He's, and contrary to what people have said or thought, like he messaged us once over two years ago and was like, I'll come one day, like from just people sending him stuff. Yeah. DMs. And I was like, great. That kept me going. I was like, that guy knows we exist. He probably forgot. And like, that's it. But that's, you know, it's good to know that like the people were talking about us, right? I get back and I tell the staff like, hey, you know, this guy might be in town. Just do everything normal. Nothing changes. If a guy comes in with a camera, have fun with it. Like, it's just, it's publicity. That's all it is. Yeah. And then on a Saturday at like 6.30, under the name Austin, and I knew Austin was the cameraman. So I was like, maybe that's him. So we, we make the cheese pizza, and literally it came out of the oven, and then he walked around the corner in his yellow-ass Michigan jacket with the camera on. I was, and I literally screamed, holy fucking shit, like as loud as humanly possible. And then like all these customers were here, and they were like, what the fuck? What the, this is happening? And I was like, great. So then he started, we chatted. You saw the video, like we chatted. He tried to say, it's like, oh, you need coal for true New Haven. I'm like, that's not true. Zoo Parties does gas. Uh, Modern Abits switched to gas years ago. There's tons of gas fired places in New Haven. So it's not about the coal. It's about just being genuine to the style, which is cold ferment your dough and cook it well done. So it's chewy, but thin and crispy at the same time. And he was like, cool, cool. And then... He ate it, and then I heard it was an 8-1, and I was like, holy fucking shit, that's amazing. Like, fuck, that's... I was literally standing there, and, like, someone was like, I hate it when uh, the chefs are hiding in the background. I'm like, I'm on a patio. 
Like I literally would have had to hide in a bush over there yeah. per, looking like a psychopath if yeah. I wasn't going to be around. But I, I think like shop owners and then just fans of those reviews, like you, if you don't understand that he is like the biggest pizza influencer or gatekeeper in the industry right now, then you, you shouldn't really be in pizza without knowing that. Because like when someone like that comes around, yeah, pay attention and do your job. And I heard they ate one and I was thrilled for, for that. And we gave the tour and it was great. And I love that they kept my story in there because we just chatted for like 10 minutes and then he yeah. left. And then that was it. And then that night he, I posted on like an Instagram story like, hey, thanks for coming, Dave. That was great. He reshared that and goes, LA, this is the best pizza in LA. And I was like, holy shit. Like stamp of approval from that guy. And then it was off to the races. Like just from the Instagram story, we increased sales the next day by like 100%. And then it started to gradually grow. So like our Wednesdays were becoming Saturdays and it was like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, were like just increasing like crazy. But then it was like, we were handling it. And at the time we had the one oven, I had five people and like, that was it. So we get through that. And then we're like, when's this video going to air? Like I have, I have enough anxiety as it is to like pay bills and all that stuff. But like, when's this fucking video going to air so we can prepare? Yeah. So I was watching some of his reviews as they were coming out and he did like a Boston bar pie tour. Yeah. Right before he came to California. And in one video he goes, yeah, this is like number three of 20. We're just banging all these out. I'm like, all right, <laughs> three of 20. That's 17 more videos to go. They air only Monday through Friday. We got a few weeks to prepare. So I just went into scaling mode right away. And I was like, what can we do to prepare for the onslaught of like just the from the video dropping. So I started to reinvest everything into production. We got more equipment. I, I've bought like 100 dough trays in the last three months. And you know how much those are. They're like 25 a tray. Yeah. Like every little bit of like earnings we had, I was putting it back into building the business to get it ready. And then the funny part was we ordered this with Woodstone, which by the way, Woodstone, you suck. Uh, we ordered this burner for underneath the oven, yeah. which was supposed to uh, help alleviate the heat dissipation from the stone. Yeah. So we'd have heat on the back, heat underneath, so we could pump out more and like be able to keep the oven from dying out as quickly as it was. Yeah. The part landed on a Wednesday, and the tech couldn't come till the Monday after. So I was like, okay, this weekend, if the video drops, it's going to be nuts, and we'll get through it. Of course, the video drops the next day, blows our mind. It's 8-1, like, it's a beautiful thing. Friends and family back east are reaching out to us. Like, it's just the most beautiful moment I've had in pizza because it was just validation for just, like, I'm a stubborn motherfucker, and I'm just going to do whatever I want that makes me happy. And, like, when people are like, you're going to make Wood New Haven in, in California, you don't have coal, you don't have this. I'm like, who cares? Like, I'm just going to have fun and just do whatever I want and make New Haven-style pizza that I grew up with. Like, that's it. So then the video drops. We got a good pop that night. And then the next day, 10 people outside to open for lunch. Friday was going really good. And I still had, like, notifications on my phone uh, for his videos because I was waiting for when it was going to drop. And then the next day, they dropped the Casa Bianca review. Yeah. And it dinged when I was out here. And my phone was connected to our speakers. I was like, oh, guys, they did Casa Bianca. Let's see how, let's see how it went. And we're watching it together. I've never watched one video review with my team ever. We're all holding around this just to watch them talk about Casa Bianca. And in that video, he goes, yeah, I, I lowballed Aussies. It's more like an 8384. And we're like, holy shit. Like, to get one video is such hard work just to get recognized in one. And then to get more press in another was just like, well, I forget about icing on a cake. Isn't it's it interesting because you, he ate here and he goes directly there. Yeah. And there are such different pizzas. Oh, 100%. So it's like you can almost thank Casa Bianca for the higher score because yeah. you know he ate that and was like, no fucking way. It's yep. like, this is getting this. I'm going to give. Th I definitely underscored Chris's. Exactly. And, like, I love Casa Bianca. I've been there a billion times, but they do, like, sort of a Chicago taverny style. Yeah. And, like, to your point, he went right from here to there. So like he was, and my, I rewatched the video, which made me kind of really even more proud of it. While I was giving him the walking tour, he hammers like three more pieces of our pizza as we're talking. And I'm like, oh, he liked it. Great. This wasn't just like a pump up thing or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, having that happen, then Friday was just insane. We sold out by like 7 PM, but then Saturday came and we had a line out the door of like 30 to open the day. And we had scaled up to, we could do about 200 
doughs for the whole day. And those were gone by five o'clock, but the weights were terrible. Like we could only do so much because we couldn't get that oven piece put in. So we're banging them out. And like, we had weights upwards of three hours that day. And to my staff's credit and to our customers, they just hung out. Like the ones that have known us forever or wanted to really try it, they made this whole place a party. Like I have like 30 tables here, which I think I told you when I got this place, I'm like, I'm never gonna fill these tables. Yeah. Now I don't have enough tables. It's insane. Like the amount of people that come here for the party atmosphere and like the fun vibe of waiting during that moment was just like, it, it blew my expectations through the wall of yeah. like what was going on. So then we got through the, that, the two weekends and then Sunday we sadly sold out at like four and we were open till seven and we had to turn away people. And I was like, we can't let this happen like ever again, like ever again. So immediately Monday, I was like, okay, the oven parts being installed tomorrow. I will focus today on hiring and scaling and figuring out our production. So that day I made two offers to two pizza guys who are now on our crew who are amazing. Full-time offers to a friend of mine, Justin, who actually worked with me at my house when we were doing the pop-up back in the day. And he's a chef, he's been in the industry for a long time, he's a good friend in comedy too. And I was like, hey, what are you making over wherever you are? He goes this, I'm like, okay, I'll pay you a dollar more and you can come tomorrow and get full-time and not worry about hours ever again. He goes, done. So he came in right away. Another guy came in from a pizzeria that was closing. This guy, Zach, who's incredible. He's, his skill set is like, I, I learned from him. I learned from all these guys now. Because I learned quickly, I can't make every pizza on my own anymore. Yeah. Like, I'll literally die. Yeah. So I hire those two. I have Milton. I have offers out for a couple more front of house. And then Tuesday rolls around. I'm like, all right, all we have to do is get the oven part in. And we're going to scale up production. It's going to be great. And I'm on a phone call with Karen Palmer, because she did that article for us for the her magazine. Yeah. And I get a call from the gym of Glen Arden, and she never calls me unless it's bad. And I, as soon as she called me, I go, the oven thing doesn't work. I already know it. Like, I already know it. So I hang up. I call her back. Yeah, that oven part doesn't work. We have a problem. I'm like, great. So I, f I fly down here. And I was supposed to do dough that day, and I still got it done. I fly down here. I talk to the tech. He's like, Woodstone screwed up. We went through three weeks of waiting for that part and, you know, vetting it to make sure it was the right one. And he's like, this isn't the right, like, we can't install this. I'm like, so we have the one oven again? And I'm, I already know how three-hour waits ain't going to fly. Like, we'll get shit on real quickly for that. So I was like, all right, I know how much money we have in the bank. I know our landlord believes in us. I had a number in my phone because the oven we used at Underdogs was an Earthstone oven. And I had this number in my phone, John Paul Earthstone. I'm like, I'm just going to call this guy and see if he's around or who. I don't know who this person is. I call him. It's John Paul, the owner of Earthstone. It's the son of the creator of Earthstone Ovens. I'm like, hey, do you guys like have a rental option or anything available? He goes, we don't have that, but you can come down to the warehouse and take a look. I'm like, okay, where are you located? He goes, oh, we're in Glendale. I'm like, what? Where in Glendale? He goes, he gives me an address. This fucking thing is five minutes away. Yeah. Down the street where they produce all of their brick ovens. And I'm like. That's that Chris Wallace look. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> Dude. God, God is great. I don't God know what else to say. Good, God is good, man. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. I was like, okay, there's an oven store uh, down the street. All right. So I, I, I get numbers of what we can afford and all. I fly down there. And by this time, I already have one batch of dough made and sitting on the table. And I run wallet proofs to go check out the ovens. Yeah. I find one. I'm like, this is great. How much? He goes, this much. I go, okay. Um, I need it tomorrow. And he just starts laughing. He's like, yeah, hey, no, we got to call the crane guy. He goes, I'm like, no, I, I need it tomorrow. And I don't know how I got into Boston. I was like, whatever you need to do, we'll make it work for you. We'll clear the path. We'll make it work. We just need that oven tomorrow. Yeah. Before opening at 12. And I come back here and we're back on the phone, back and forth. He comes and visits the site. <laughs> Turns out he's good friends or knows the landlord because they have ovens in their properties from Earthstone. And then on top of it, he went to high school with the GM of Glen Arden. So like all these little serendipitous things were happening. Yeah. And then we got, we agreed on a price and he's like, yeah, the oven guy can be there in the morning at 8 a.m. to install and get everything good. I was like, great. So from in 48 hours, I had four employees, one oven and a part that was supposed to work. 40 hours later, I have two ovens, 10 employees and our life just takes off. Yeah. We come in, we get the oven in. And then from that day on, we started to scale and we restructured the kitchen. We restructured everything. But that week was the busiest week of all time, like ever, because that's where like the video started to really gain traction and everyone saw it. So by Saturday, we got wait times down to 90 minutes 
for two ovens, which I was so grateful about. I got Griffin Baker, pizza maker, working with me now, who yeah. is, he's such a smart, like energetic kid. And he just wants to learn. Yeah. And like, he's on the new oven. And I remember I took a photo of him and Milton cooking pizzas on both ovens at the same time. And like, I cried like a little when I got home, just like where it came from, what I've been through and like what the company's been through to like see that yeah. was just like mind blowing. And then by Saturday, like to, to give you perspective, like we've, we were doing 400 to 500 pizzas on Saturdays and Fridays. And like, that's 400% increase, you know, from before our video. So like it does, it does happen. Like you get blown up and if you make a good product, it, people are going to come. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's just been literally like that ever since. And then what was great was we were able to scale up, hired a front of house manager who was actually my neighbor who uh, we used to do pizza parties during COVID. Yeah. And she was the one with her husband, Austin was like, Hey, you should like sell these. I'm like, I don't know what that means. I don't, I, I have an apartment. I don't get it. But she was like, gave me the seed, Jamie, like to like do it. And then now she's my front of house manager and she's incredible and like just puts everything together. And now as of yesterday, we have 15 employees. I have two, three pizza makers in back now because that weekend with the 500, I've told you this off camera, but I blew my back out. Yeah. I was making every single one myself and I blew my back out because I was leaning up so much back and forth, back and forth. I couldn't stand up on like Sunday morning. I couldn't get out of bed. Yeah. So I, I like got my shit together, took a bunch of Advil, bought a back brace from like CVS for like 35 bucks and wore that thing for three weeks straight just to get through the first onslaught of everything. And that's when, and I remember I'm grateful that I have Chris Bianco's phone number. And like when this happened, I texted him like, what should I get prepared for? And it's like, just enjoy the ride, brother. Don't burn out, you know, and learn to like train and learn to not do everything. Mm -hmm. So immediately I was like, okay, so I got the pizza guys. I started easing up on making everything. And that was really where like Ozzy's started to grow and like become like, we're a full blown quick service pizza place now. And like every weekend we're filled and to not worry about sales and in the restaurant industry is insane. Yeah. It's just, it's fucking crazy. Like it's just mind blowing. Like, like, I never thought my wildest dreams this would happen in three months. You said it to me. We were talking one time and you're like, you scaled what people do in five years in like three months. And yeah. I, and I'm like, I know I'm tired. Yeah. And that's why I got it tatted on my leg now in honor of you. Cause it's on your wall. Yeah. But it's true. Like we've put in so much hard work and discipline and training to get everything to where it is now. Yeah. And I, I'll never like, I'll look back on this on my deathbed and be like, that was the best fucking time of my life. It still is. But like those crazy days of just like nonstop, nonstop orders, that ticket machine, it's that episode of the bear where the online orders go on and they mm -hmm. weren't ready for it. It was like that for three weeks straight and we had fun with it. And you know, there was times where people, we got frustrated with each other. We got through, we're family. Like every one of the people on my staff is family to me. Yeah. And like, sometimes you fight with your family and I, I've had to really elevate my thought process on being an owner and being a businessman and but most importantly being a teacher and helping people like learn what to do in these situations. Cause I learned very quickly, I can't be here every day, like doing everything. Yeah. And I'm so grateful now I can come in and things are ready or I can jump on the line and help, or it, it's just like, I mean, you've been through it and it's so, I never like envisioned a day where I wouldn't have to show up to the shop and have a day off. And gratefully, since then, I've been able to visit my family back home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we went to the Pizza Expo. Unfortunately, I get sick at the Pizza Expo because my body's like, hey, you're not making pizza. Fuck you. We're going to give you whatever uh, virus is out there right now and enjoy it. And then I get back and I go see my nephew in Connecticut. And then when I'm like talking to family and friends there, that was like my first moment in three months where I could sit back and just just appreciate my life now. Yeah. And appreciate Ozzy's and, you know. It's great. The worst part is I still come home every night and he's like, where's the fucking pizza? Like, I smell it on you. What, what the hell, man? Like, I want crust every night. Like, you have nothing without me. I'm the face of your company. He's a son of a bitch, dude. I had to get him a lawyer. It's crazy. He's just, he's a nut job. Uh, well, I'm sure as long as he's being walked and fed. Oh, yeah. And loved, which that's, that's obvious. There's nothing the without buzz. this guy. Let's unpack this a little bit. Go, go nuts, my friend. I, when I met you, you have, like I said, you have great energy. And I remember when we ate at, uh, is it called Best Friend in Vegas? Yeah. Yeah. 
a lot. I think seeing your story, even being close to you and knowing you, but not knowing you that well, it's almost like a fairy tale situation. And like, there is some voyeurism to see, but I guess to, for people to even see closer, we went to that dinner just, and I'll never forget this dinner because, you know, like we get in there, we're having a good time. You, you're, you always introduce uh, me to, to the friends that were there. Yeah. And I mean, Roy Choi was there and you were like, I'm going to go talk to Roy Choi. And I'm just like, God damn, dude, Chris <laughs> just doesn't give a fuck. This is something that I would never do. Like, I just, I kind of like, you know, I'd eat my meal and be like, oh man, that's so crazy. And I remember you just being like, you said to me, I don't give a fuck what anyone thinks about me. Like, I'm going to do whatever I want. And that, that really struck a chord with me because I was like, this guy and he came over. He came over. He said hi to the table. Yeah, he he took really pictures nice. with us. He was super nice. You, It was an opportunity to meet somebody that you looked up to. You took the opportunity. And I think that that was a microcosm for maybe how, I mean, and then like we went to the Mike's Hot Honey Party and you went and talked to Polly G and like you just, you work a room and you, you are yourself all the time. And I think that there is so much power in that confidence that- that people don't understand that. And it was incredible to see. It's been an inspiration to watch you grow the way that you have and have the confidence that you have had to do it. And I think, you know, sometimes even being a pizza shop owner, like I'm not going to sit here and not be honest. Like, fuck, dude, I've been doing this for so long. And it's crazy to, to watch somebody like you just go from from fucking zero to a thousand but to know that you deserve it and that everyone's path is different is has been humbling and it has been it has been wild to watch and it's it's because not everyone is greased like you are you know what i mean like i just want everyone to know that that story that you told how much hard work there is how much stuff there is things that people don't even know about and just what you have what you've gone through, what I've seen. And, you know, dude, you have spent, you've, you've sent so many people into hot tongue. It's been crazy. More people than Lewis from the pet store, but <laughs> people have been like, you're such a, like, that's the kind of dude that you are, man. It's, it's, I don't know where I was going with this other than like, I do think that like when people hear this story, it sounds like maybe it's a, it's a lot of coincidences or luck. I do think you make your own luck and being next to you and, and watching you go from like underdogs two days to a Dave Portnoy review. Like there was things before that, you know, you, you put yourself out there. So many, I think pizzeria owners don't do that. Don't have the confidence to say, Hey, Matthew Kang over here. Or like, Hey, Farley Elliott, like, check me out. Or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. not that you had to be like, hey, me, 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 me. But that's kind of what you, sometimes what you have to do. That's hard work. Right? Oh, it's it's draining. And, like, first of all, thanks, man. I mean, you know, I love you. But that's, when it, like, whenever people come here and they're like, where do you eat? I go, I go to Hot Tongue. I go to La Sordids. I go to Secret. I, I mean, I run out of names now because I'm friends with all of them because of the community vibe. For me, it was like I never had a real sense of belonging in my life anywhere. Like, I grew up, like I said, in Connecticut, but, like, I always tried to fit in. Like, I remember when I was younger, remember those those Columbia House little uh, CD flyers? You send in a penny, you get 12 CDs and mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. I remember I got into, like, pop punk first, right? And I still am to this day and because uh, some friends were into it, but I loved that Blink-182 Dude Ranch CD more than anything. And I to this day, it's, like, my favorite thing to listen to when I'm stressed out. Mm hmm and I remember I'm listening to it at like 11 years old and all that stuff. And I'm like, oh, I found like stuff I like. And then three days later, everyone on my street that we play football with is like, oh, we like rap now. And I was like, oh, shit. So I go find a, the other Columbia house when I never sent in. I sent in for 12 more CDs. My dad hated me, by the way, because they would send him like $50 CDs out of nowhere. And I'd be like, I don't know what happened. Whatever. I have no idea. And I'm like, now I'm a rap kid, whatever. And it's like, I always fucking tried to fit in all the time. And like, I grew up in a very Catholic household, went to Catholic school. And I always watched like MTV and watch these kids that were like free, if you were like I'd watch like the real and be like, oh, like I'd love to be 
confident like that one day to even talk to a girl and like all this kind of stuff that like I didn't have. And you know, part of my story is like my mom passed away when I was 19 and I was right in the middle of like my second year of college. And that's also where like my alcoholism really started to ramp up because I was like so unhappy with her dying and I'm not happy with myself and like my body and everything. So at that time I was like, fuck it, I'll lose a bunch of weight. And I got, I literally had an eating disorder. I got anorexic and I lost hundred pounds in a year. I was 140 pounds soaking wet and more miserable than I was beforehand because I was never happy with myself. I always try to do everything for other people and not like be kind and be of service, but like just, just to prove myself. And I think in pizza, especially if you just do what you fucking want, people will come. And like when I started making pizza and realized people liked it for what it was and because it was just my product, like what I wanted to do, I was like, fine, I'm never going to, that's it. Like that was the catalyst of like, fuck what anybody thinks about anything I do. You know, it's all about building a community. And I finally found my thing at, this was at 35. I'm like, this is it. Like I'm talking to myself about it. And that was the year I got sober too. And that's a big part of my story as well. And I'm not afraid to hide it. I was a major alcoholic still. I identify as an alcoholic because I would drown my sorrows in drinking and booze and drugs and all that shit. And I'd wake up miserable every day, blame the world and all that stuff. And I, there was no voice. There was no like coming to Jesus moment that people get. I was just like, I'm fed up with feeling shitty. So I got sober and I, I relapsed once, but I'm grateful to say I'm almost two years sober now. And I just got clear headed to see like what I want to do. And it was like, it's pizza. It's, it's been in me the whole time. I literally flew. I moved to California because a girl broke up with me that I thought I was going to marry. And then I was in a shitty fucking construction job and I was miserable drinking, just living in an attic. Like I was, I hated everything. And my buddy in Newport beach was like, do you want to like move in with me in six months? And I was like, yep, I'll figure it out. And that was maybe where it started. Like that, you were saying my drive. I've always been the guy that like, I'll just figure it out. I'd rather just figure it out on my own. And like, I'll, I'll ask for help. But I literally moved here with no return flight and a suitcase and moved to Newport beach and got a job within like 29 days. I had 30 days worth of money. And on day 29, I got hired at like a full-time job. And I was like, all right, I'm staying. And I called my boss. I'm like, I'm not coming back. Cause he laughed. I remember he was like, Oh, you're going to move to California. All right, good luck. And I called him on day 29. I'm like, I'm not coming back. And I was like, he's a friend, but I was like, fuck you, man. Yeah. You don't believe me? Seriously, fuck off. Yeah. And I lived there for a while, but my addiction kept growing and growing and growing. And my, I've always been into comedy. So I was like, I'll move to LA and do comedy. And then the thing is like, the, Instagram's rough, right? We, we put up on our personal pages, the best pictures and the facade of like, we're happy. All those years in comedy, I was so fucking miserable just trying to make people laugh. And I wasn't bad at it. It was just like, I just wanted to get on stage, make people laugh, and then drink as soon as possible. And then go home and just, like, not think about who I was. And I dated the, the wrong type of women, and I was just unhappy in my situation. I was living in a three-bedroom apartment. This is a funny situation. I was living in a three-bedroom apartment. They built their old, like, closet room into, like, a bedroom and put it on Craigslist. I got it, and then I get in, and there's a full bedroom next to me, like, just a massive room. And I'm like, can I rent that room? They go, no, that's for my son, Daniel. And I was like, well, when's he here? He's like, oh, like every couple of weeks or so. I'm like, can he have the room I'm about to rent? That's the size of like me and Ozzy put together. They're like, no, no, it's this one. So for two and a half years, I live in a closet. And by the way, my roommates were great people. They actually helped me get sober at the end of it all. But like, I've, I've been through the fucking ringer yeah. with all that stuff. So like now what's great is like with Ozzy's and everything, it's just, it's a hundred percent who I am. And it'll always will be. And like, I really don't give a flying fuck like what you think about what I do, because I do it from a genuine place and it's all authentic and it's just like 100% who I am. Yeah. And I'll make mistakes. I've made mistakes. We're always going to make mistakes. But I, I now I'm grateful that I can learn from them all and learn from people every day. From that time we sat down till now, I've learned so much about the pizza industry. Yeah. F have friends like you and Tommy and people all over the country. And I always like wanted that to happen to like the industry I would go into and like have that community. Like I call my my customers, fans, Ozheads because it's fun. Like it's just a fun thing to do to make them feel like they're part of a community because I'm that person. Yeah. For years I felt so empty and hollow and I never felt like I belonged anywhere. Like I was borderline suicidal once. Like I was, I had, I like, 
if I choke up, sorry. It's just like it was. I was so close to ending it all before anything took over yeah. for pizza, and I'm so glad I didn't. And then another big part of why this all exists is because of this little dude right here. Because you know, I adopted him when he was two. This is funny. His name was Bono at the shelter. <laughs> That's a sick and, ass dog name. Yeah, I was like, no, 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 we're not naming you Bono. Good. I like you too, but no. I'm like, I'm not gonna be calling you Bono the rest of your goddamn life. And then, uh, sorry, Vito. Yeah, whatever. It's a beautiful day. <laughs> it is. Well done. Dad joke. Nice. But I got him, and then, like, I always wanted a dog. And, like, ever since that, it's just, like, as long as I could do it for him and just come home and relax and chill with my dog. And, like, then I, like, my friend helped me name it Ozzy's because one day we were cooking, and there was just crumbs on the floor, and Ozzy's eating shit off the floor. And he's like, you should call it Ozzy's. I'm like, done. Like, no, there's tons of Chris's pizzas out there, like, Ozzy is me, like, we're, like, look at this dude. I love this guy. He's, he's the been, best. He's being such a sweet boy on your lap. He's amazing. I love him to death. You want to say something? Yeah, you little... Big yawn. Yeah. But it's like, I, I had none of this without getting sober and getting healthy and then getting a good group of people around me. And that's why, like, it's, like, when you say, like, you just don't give a fuck. I really don't. Like, I used to care so much about what anyone thinks about me that it was such a waste of energy. Like, it's just such a waste of energy. And now, like, well, I do, I joke around whenever there's a one-star review that's just ridiculous. Like, something about, like, we had a guy the first week of the, the Portnoy stuff. He came in at, like, 7.30, and we're like, hey, man, sorry, we're sold out. And he goes, sold out? This is bullshit. And, like, walked down. By the way, we know that guy. He used to come here. We always thought he was a serial killer. We kind of still think he's a serial killer because he's just one of those dudes that you just don't want to be there's left dead, alone there's with. There's dead bodies in yeah, his basement. Absolutely, yeah. at least three or four. And he goes right home and he goes, oh, uh, one star review. Uh, try to get pizza to 730, sold out. This is bullshit. Get your shit together. And I ripped him a new one. And like everything I just told you, we did that week. I got, And I listed it. But then at the end of it, I was like, dude, sorry you don't like it. You know, sorry you live in a life where you're upset that you can't get a pizza on a Friday night. Yeah. You know, that's, that's on you, man. Like much love. I try to say it to people, like love you all. Like, you know. Fuck off, though, if you're going to, you know, come at me or come at my staff or whatever. Like, that's the best part about being yourself. You could just, I'll take it all. Like, whatever. It's, there's nothing else to do now. Yeah. your face is out there. And you know that. Like, your face is out there. Like, you got to take it all. Yeah. Like we said this morning, the customer is not always right. The customer, I used to have a bit. I, I used to go uh, in the audience and be like, who here works in the restaurant industry? Everyone, you know, it's L.A. Everyone goes, yeah, yeah. And I go, all right, let's say it with me. You learn it on day one, guys. The customer is always a piece of shit. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and everyone, if it was it was always funny. But it's, I mean, it, there's two sides of it. Like, our loyal customers and customers in general are great. 90% of people are great. Yeah, yeah, but there's that 10%. Who, I think, if Prime Pizza, Zach, who is, a, a, like, you want to learn how to scale. Talk to that guy. I watched that yes. podcast. As soon as Dave came, I watched the, the your podcast with him and listened to him in the scaling. And we're friends and we text. And by the way, all the people that messaged me the day that Dave came by, that night, you, uh, David Turkel, uh, I think Tommy texted me, Sean from Secret Pizza, Griffin, Zach. And me and Zach had only met maybe two times. Yeah. Zach, he had my number. Reached out and was like, hey, you get ready. You need anything. You need cooler space. And that's the thing I, I don't think people, especially the New York scene, don't understand about L.A. Like when something like this happens, we all come together the, to help each other out. Yeah. And like you guys were all there for me and like we'll always be there for you. And the, like when I tell people go to Hot Tongue, it's not because I want to send you business because I want you to try my favorite pizza. Yeah. In L.A. And one of my favorite people, Alex, like that's just how it is. Yeah. And the fact we get to do that for each other is fucking awesome. Yeah. And like, you know, it just makes me so happy. Like from this, I'm able to give people, I got 10 more jobs now. I know that, that you know. To get into, I want to go back real quick to the, to the, to your confidence, because I think one, you have to have a great product. Okay. There's, of course. There's no denying that you have to be doing something that's great. I think, mm -hmm. one, I couldn't, before I ever met you, I don't even think I knew anyone marketing their pizza as New Haven. Okay. Not out here. I, I'd never yeah. even heard of a Beats. I think I'd had maybe like a Pizza Expo or like sure. Red and PMQ or some shit. Uh, but you had that going for you. 
you had you had good product and then but you had yourself and it, and do you want to talk about selling yourself or reaching out to the right people before we get into Portnoy just because yeah. prior prior to Portnoy you're you were already like you were very new but you were already kind of like I let's say climbing in the pizza scene just you know through infatuation or or eater or whatever yeah, yeah. you know do you want to talk about how the, the how or give advice on how to properly oh, use those channels to absolutely. For business. I think like being a comedian and when I had to hustle to get on shows is a huge part of why I was comfortable being able to reach out to pizza people. Because when you're a comedian new in LA, you got to reach out to these promoters, ask to be on shows, sometimes pay to be on shows, send your reels and all of that. So it's an audition every time. When I got into pizza, I immediately, like I watched the pizza show on Vice, like probably. I don't know, over a hundred times with when Pinello did that just to like, I got so absorbed in the culture. And then David Chang did an episode on his, uh, what was that? Uh, ugly, ugly delicious about pizza and new Haven and the culture. And I was like, why does no one do new Haven? I looked it up and it was the cold thing. I'm like, you could do new Haven style. It's more than just an oven. But for me reaching out to people, it was, I think some big advice that I've always lived with, especially in the last five years is begging gets you nowhere. Like, I never begged for a review. I never asked for anyone to come by in, like, a begging way. If I see a post or something, like, with Eater, Farley reached out to us. I followed Eater because they're Eater, you know? And Farley reached out when he goes, hey, I'm going to come by for pizza tonight. Uh, what do you recommend? And that's when I started to realize a lot of these people in our industry are just genuine and want to support and just, you know, your job as the chef or the owner is to give good product mm -hmm. and their job is to review it or to talk about it or whatever. So Farley, the first one, he reached out to us on a, like a Saturday and he came by, ate the pizza. And then, and then a week later had that article, which was great. And then all the write-ups were just, we never knew the Bill Addison one. So that one happened, uh, right when we opened here. So Bill Addison did that whole write-up of the LA times, uh, they're like 21 favorites and like saying like LA has a scene now. That's a great article. Yeah. And I was away at home doing a pizza festival in New Haven, which still fucking blows my mind. I got invited to do New Haven style pizza in my hometown while owning a shop in LA. And I, my tent was next to Frank Pepe's tent, Frank Pepe, the, the originator of New Haven style or whatever you want to call it. And I remember I'm there or I'm on the plane with big Mike, Mikey rabbit, and we're on the plane and I turn my phone on and I have like a hundred notifications. I'm like, okay, something happened. And it's, it was that article came out and we had small staff that week. And I was like, guys, just do the best you can get through it. It was great. They got their first like experience with a rush, like a real rush of business. And then while we were at the, that pizza festival, um, Frank Pepe's, uh, I think nephew, comes over to me and goes, hi, is this your shop? And I was like, yeah, that's my shop. Oh, well, my daughter's there right now eating your pizza while you're here cooking next to us. And it's like, those aren't like, that's the hustle of life right there. Like you work your ass off those little like moments where like God or whatever you believe in pats you on the back a little bit will happen. You just got to be clear headed to recognize them. Ooh, we want the vegan meats. We want the vegan cheeses. Are people coming up to you and asking you, do you have vegan options? Do you have vegan meats? Well, guess what? A lot of them are not that good. But there is one that reigns superior, and that is Beehive. Everything that they make at Beehive is levels ahead of what you can get in a grocery store. Their pepperoni, their crumbled sausage, their cheeses, there is no contest. And the owner is one of the coolest people I have ever met. They make incredible products that go on your pizza, and it is dope plant food. That's what they call it, and that's what it is. Beehive, the best look no further it's beehive baby straight out of nashville good people great product check them out do you do you how do i say this without sounding too crazy do first you, of all you are crazy do you look at that beautiful hummingbird do you this is a case this, in point this might want to be one of the most beautiful beautiful settings we've had next yeah. to the uh, pizza pilgrims uh penthouse studio anyways uh do, do, do you do you have a vision board or like do you do you do you set intentions because like you're you're talking about some crazy meta shit when you're yeah you're you you fuck i mean that's a crazy fucking thing man like yeah. you're 
You're young in the game. You just get written up 21 best pizzas in L.A. Times while you're going to cook, you know, in your hometown. And then, you know, th- the daughter, right? Was yeah. it his daughter yeah, his is daughter eating at you. Like, I mean, what, what the fuck? Is I this have, something that you... Never. You know? No. Fucking no. <laughs> no. I thought we'd be uh, out of business in three years. Like, like <laughs> you know, I didn't know what the That f- is not true. That is no, 100% no. not true. No, I mean, like, you know, I thought there was a... There, I knew there'd be a grind, no matter what. I didn't know the level of the grind or how quick it would happen. Yeah. But when I got into this, like, I literally said, I'm putting every bit of my energy into this, no matter what. Yeah. And then Craig Taylor, my business partner, who's also from Connecticut, joined up. And when I had someone support from Connecticut that knows the style, I was like this. And then once I started feeling the support of others, I was like, no one can stop us. Like, or even in general, no one can stop me. Cause if you have support and you believe in yourself, there's no one can fucking stop you. Yeah. I would just, I'm also, I think a big thing to tell people is like, I'm not afraid to fail at anything. Yeah. Like I failed. I'm going to run through my list of jobs that I either left or was about to be fired from because I, I hated being there. I was a undercover security agent at Target Sick. for three years, which was a blast, by the way. It sounds catching like a shoplifters at job. the door. I've been stabbed. I've had all this shit happen Holy when shit. I was there. Oh yeah, he got ripped my favorite shirt. It was a little pen knife, so I'm not that tough. Okay, but that happened, and then I graduate college in 2011 after quitting college because I was in college for seven years the Van Wilder way because my mom died and I wanted to just I wanted to give up everything. Went back, hustled. I went to school full-time at night and the weekends and took classes every break so I can graduate in two years while working that full-time job at Target. Yeah. Get that done. They hire me as a manager at $48,000 a year in Connecticut. And I had to drive an hour every day to my store that I was running. Yeah. And I don't know if you know this, but retail sucks and it's terrible. I've heard that. And I was working 60, 70 hours a week at $48,000 an hour. So you're doing the math. I was making less than like the hourly employees. And I'll never forget this moment. I'm in, I had. A, I get called in to fucking zone an aisle. Zone means shelf the aisle, make it look nice for customers. Mm-hmm. Because the night before it was a mess, whatever. And I'm in the feminine products aisle, taking tampon boxes off the ground and putting them on a shelf. And my manager looks at me and goes, so Chris, how do you like the job so far? And I'm like, it fucking sucks. And like, it just came out. I was like, this is, I went to school. I have 40 or 50 grand in fucking student loans. And I'm putting tampons on a shelf at your store at 5 a.m. And he was like, oh. And I, I knew at that moment, he's like, Chris ain't going to survive this thing. I'm like, I, like I couldn't help it myself. Yeah. And then from there, went into construction. I wanted to do more, but my boss was like, you, you're not going to make more because you got to be an apprentice and all that. And I was like, whatever. I was going to be a personal trainer. I was like, didn't, I bought the class, didn't even do it. Like, then I moved here and I worked in security management again. Hated it because I had a, a phone that was on 24-7. And if someone broke into a store, I get a call at 3 a.m. I couldn't keep a relationship. I was drinking myself under the water. And then, like, I move up here. I'm struggling to be a comedian. But when I moved up here, I was working for Mod Pizza. And Mod let me become a manager of the North Hollywood location. And I was like, this is fun. Even though I was doing it for a corporate entity, that's where the bug, like, kicked in. And I was like, this is fucking fun. Yeah. And brick oven, massive amounts of volume, just going nuts. And that's where I was like, this is fun. Maybe one day if I, I could do this. But at the time, I just was focused on comedy. But then I missed it. When I left to go into beer sales, I was like, I missed it, like, just being there and having a place where people would come see us and make food. But then I was in beer sales for six years. And then three of them, or three, almost three of them, I was sober. And I'm selling a product I can't drink. And I don't want to drink it. And yeah. I'm, I'm selling it to people and telling them that. And, like, I, would, I remember I get a sale. They're like, wow, like you don't drink this? How, like, how are your sales numbers? I'm like, they're great. Cause I literally just tell you, this is great. Drink it. Yeah. Do you drink it? No. Well, well, then why should I buy it? I'm like, cause it's cheaper than that. And it's better than that. Drink it. Try it now. Go. And I would give extra samples out cause I don't drink them. And I was just like, have fun with it. And I did that, but I knew I, so this is the last part of it was like, I, had, I was at this job giant and I knew if I could just grind my fucking ass off when I wasn't on the clock at giant with underdogs and Aussies at the time, It would just start to go. And anytime I was doing pizza stuff is when I could be myself, like, even more. So, like, last year we went to the expo for my first time. I just took that as, like, I'm going to meet my heroes in pizza. And I'm going to not, I'm not going to, like, all bets are off. I'm going to say hi. 
I'm going to do whatever I have to do just to say hello, just to put myself out there. Yeah. Not expecting anything from it. But while I was there, even funnier story, uh, Steve Dolinsky, the guy who runs um, the Pizza City Fest. Yeah. We're doing it again this year. You're doing it on Saturday. Yep. And he's a big, you know, foodie guy from Chicago. And I reached out. I was like, hey, I saw this festival's happening. We're one of the newer pizzerias. Is there any openings this year? He goes, no, but, you know, we'll come by next year, check, check, check your pizza out, and, you know, maybe we'll add you. He's like, great, thank you, no problem. I sent that message from my hotel room at in Vegas, and then I walked downstairs to my distributor's uh, booth, and I say hi to my distributor, Serenza Foods, love him to death, and Steve Dolinsky's standing there filming something randomly. Yeah. And, like, these moments, like, you call it luck, whatever, no, it's – I really feel if you put the power of the universe and let the universe do its thing, because the other thing I've, I've grown to learn is like, I have no control over anything. Mm -hmm. This whole fucking orb thing we're, we're on, all that. We got no control over this fucking thing. There was an eclipse today. This is bigger than all of us. Yeah. Okay. So if you could right size yourself and just be like, all right, I make pizza. I have fun with it. And let's just, let's just, there's no harm in talking to someone. Yes. I walk up to Steve. We say hi. We're cordial. He's like, oh, I'll come by when I, I'm in LA for the festival. That'd be great. Three days later, Best Bet Pizza drops out. He calls me right away and goes, do you want to take their spot? Boom. If I didn't reach out just saying hi, yep. that would never have happened. And now we have a great relationship. We went to lunch yesterday. Yeah. And we're one of the people featured on the Sunday this year. And, like, these are the things, like, I just have no, there's no, there's no risk in doing any of this stuff, talking to people and doing all that. And being genuine and like, I don't want to hammer on the sobriety shit too much, but that's just, if I didn't get sober, I wouldn't be able to do any of the stuff I do. Of course. And like, so all the energy I used to put into finding booze and Coke and getting stupid and all that, I put into the business. I put into just putting out genuine shit on our Instagram or whatever and just being myself. Yeah. And like for that expo, you were there, you were just talking about the Mike's and Honey Party. I remember looking around, I'm like, holy shit, Paul G just said hi. Holy shit, uh, Pizza John said hi. Met Mark for the first time from uh, Square Pie Guys. And now we're all friends. Yeah. Like, yeah, you have no... I mean, are you, it's probably easy for you to maybe um, to minimize it, but it, it, is a, it, is a huge, it is a huge talent and power to just go up to somebody and say hello and be yourself because... Because putting yourself out there and and doing those kind of things are is tough. It's really hard. But and, but you w without without saying hello, you never have a conversation, right? If if you don't try, it's never going to happen. Yeah. Like in anything we do, if you don't try, you can never. Like there's so many. Like you want to like go smaller. Like when I was like in college and I lose all the weight and, and everyone's like, "Oh, dude, you're so fucking looking great. You're gonna have a great life." I'm like, that means fucking nothing. And by the way, you think just because you look great, you're gonna have a great life? Yeah. Like no. Jesus Christ, that is man! Not the, that is it's not so the case. superficial. And like I remember, there I had opportunities to date some very beautiful women back in the day, and I never took the chance because I was so afraid of rejection. And that's I think for me, and I, this is another thing. I used to be so afraid of rejection. In every facet of my life. I think a lot of people are. And it's a huge problem because it, rejection leads to anxiety, leads to, you know, uh, con alcohol, whatever, whatever you want to do. But rejection keeps us from doing shit. Like, it literally keeps us from trying shit because we're afraid we're going to fail. So it's like, who the fuck's calling me? I'm not answering. Um, and Rejection. Uh, speaking of rejection. <laughs> reject. Well, that guy's he hates himself. Uh <laughs> <laughs> oh god all right who was that oh fuck him um what was i saying oh yeah so rejection uh no but like dude you we've all been through this right we're all yep. afraid to talk to the girl at the dance or or fucking you know go for the job you want or move to california to pursue a dream and entertainment or something like i f from like when i was a little kid always wanted more and I was remember like when I was a little kid and like my dad had his full time job and my mom was working from home a lot. And I always just felt like I didn't want to be small in this world. Like if I'm going to be here, I want to put an impact on it. It's not a fame thing. It's not anything. I just want to leave a mark here because that's all we can do. And when I was in Connecticut, I always felt so like closed off from being able to do that. And once I got here and then the, like when I got sober, I was like, oh, none of that shit fucking matters. Just do whatever you want to make yourself happy. Like, you know, and that's what I started to do. 
and when I talk to these people and I approach these people, it's from a real genuine love of them. And that's the thing too. Like I love pizza. I love the art of making food for people. I love talking to people. I love meeting new people. And I love being a caring person because that's what my mother taught me to be. And I'll always be that kind of person. So like whenever I've approached these people, I think that's a big caveat to like, don't be begging or whatever. I always approach it with so much love from an adulation, no matter what you are. And I think the thing I learned last year at the expo was we're all the same in some way, shape or form. What they say cut from the same cloth, mm -hmm. but maybe just at different levels in their business or different levels of their success. Mm -hmm. And in pizza, especially the real good people don't like, they don't hold that over the other person. Yeah. I learned so much last year about product business, um, scaling, and then also just how to, like to, to meet people and yeah. to network. And then now a year later I'm there and they're all coming up to me to say hi and like, Oh, it's so good to see you and all that. And like people asking me like what they should do. And I'm like, I don't fucking, it's like, what? I don't. And then, but you have to be able to be available because I was asking you those same questions. And I still ask you questions all the time and people that want to learn this game, you got to learn from the people that were here before you. Yeah. And, and that's the only way you could do it. And the other thing I'll say for me is that when I was in comedy, hustling and that, trying to get on stages and get more time, and, you know, I learned how not to be with people. I've met some shitty fucking people in that industry that treat people like garbage and treat you like garbage, if you even if you book them on a show. And I was really getting an education on how not to be in this world, and I was like, I, that's where I really was like, I'm never going to be like that. Yeah. And the only way for me to do that was to get sober and realize who I was as a person. And then now it's just all gravy. Like all this stuff's just gravy. It's just, it's insane, but it, it leads to the fuel that builds this up. Like, was there a vision board? No. Like, I hate to say it. Like, I just, every day I'm grateful I wake up. And yeah. If I wake up, I go, okay, what are we doing today? For me, I live in the present. So like, I know X, Y, Z is going to happen this month, next month, whatever, next year. But I don't think about that. I think about today and how to get through today. And like my day today was I get to see Alex. I get to see Matt. I get to see Ozzy. I get to hang out. And then tonight I'm going to a Between the Better Me concert, Santa Ana. And then tomorrow I go to an A meeting at 7 a.m. And that's my life. And it's like, it's great to like kind of microcosm that a little bit. You ain't future tripping. No, no. That, I love that term. I like, just heard it for the first time today, actually. Really? Yeah. It's yours now. <laughs> that is now mine. That is now Alex Coons quoted, never said before, uh, future, future tripping. tripping. Uh, is that what that means, by the way? What? Future tripping. Like, to not trip over the future. There you go. Yeah. Done. Um, just by the way, Michael Hiller said that. So Hiller, love him. Yeah. Um, all right. So I want to get into the Portnoy thing because Portnoy is a polarizing character. Yeah. You know, people, you either love him or you hate him. And we can unpack that while also unpacking because he is the biggest influencer, a, a person that whether he gives you a... Six eight or an eight one can change your business forever. Mm -hmm. uh, even a bad score is a good score from this dude. Yeah, it's publicity. Um, so, you know, first off, because I know a lot of people want to know, is there a secret of getting this man in here? I remember in his review, I think he says like, "This guy's been hitting me up for years." <laughs> yeah, I remember that. That was funny. Well, like I said, I'm crazy and I have no fear of rejection. Yes. Uh, when I was doing the pop-up at my house, he reviewed um, a place in Philly called Good Pizza. And it was a dude just doing pizza out of his apartment building in Philly. Yeah. And I saw that. I go, oh, he might go to pop-up. So I just messaged him, hey, I do a New Haven style pop-up in California. Come by. My grandiose thinking, like, he's going to show up at my apartment one day to do a video. I, didn't, I had no clue what was going to happen. No response. That's it. I left it alone for the longest time, because what are you going to do, bug him to show up across the country? Yeah. Then what happened was when we got the Eater article, people started sending him the Eater article, like just customers of ours. And we would get tagged in those, like, those mentions and all that stuff. So that's when I, like, one time I got mentioned with him, and I was like, hey, dude, if you ever want to come by, we're in underdogs, come by. And he literally said, I will one day. Like I, I, and I was like, cool. Oh, my God, he responded, great. And he is the biggest pizza influencer out there. Like, let's just call a spade a spade, like, the dude's been doing this for, what, almost a decade now? And he goes to shops, and those videos get a minimum of, like, 200,000 views within, like, two days just on YouTube. And then they're also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. 
So you get exposure if you if he comes to your shop, good or bad, right? Yeah. So for him, he was saying that I think that's just his way of like being the machismo guy. Like he's got to be the 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 main man of the video, which I get it. He's playing a pseudo character in in itself when he's on camera. Yes. But when he came in, he said, that. "I was like, yeah, whatever." They're like, sure. I had him up three times. I, I literally three times over the course of four years. So. If that's a lot, sure, whatever. Well, check it out. I remember, because the whole thing was fucking surreal and has been, again, like I said, to even, like, to even see it as an outsider, you know, and yeah. see what you've gone through. But, I mean, you, so you hit him up three times. Probably other people were were trying to get him in here for you. And I remember you hit up me and a couple other pizza makers and you're like, yo, Portner is going to be in town. Yeah. You guys should reach out. Yeah. And, uh, and then it was fucking crazy because then like the next text I get from you is like, or it wasn't even a text. I think I might've saw like, I think I, don't know, I what, sent you did, the photo. Yeah. You, or you, something. you said it. I think something came back to that same chat and he was at your place. And I yeah. was like, what the actual fuck? I don't know. Like, you know, people want people, and you know I've already talked about this, but he is a golden ticket to some people. Sure. And people, they want that exposure. They want that. They want that golden ticket. You know. Oh and yeah. Is there, is there any cheat codes for getting him in here? Uh, buy Game Shark on eBay for ten dollars. <laughs> plug it in at home, and wait for the right code, and then maybe just play it on your uh, Sega Genesis every day. I don't think there's a cheat code. Listen, I know I make New Haven style pizza. Yeah. I know he prefers that. Yes. So I always knew from day one, I'm not stupid. If he ever was to come out here, he might come to us because we make New Haven style pizza in Los Angeles. And we're the only one that advertises that. So I'm not stupid to think that he would never come. So like, I always knew in the back of my head, he might show up one day. Great. But also from that, I realized that we'll always be polarizing ourselves because we make New Haven style pizza with a gas brick oven. So we were already prepared for heat from that when people would be like, you don't use coal, this and that and whatever. So like, I have a very tough skin. Like I know what I make. I'm very proud of what I make. So I always was prepared for any of those conversations to happen. Yeah. And for him to bring it up in the review, I'm glad he did because I was ready to just to counter back with like, yeah, dude, the party says gas. Like everyone, there's so many different places in New Haven now that don't use coal. So like, don't hold that as like the, the bastion of what New Haven pizza is. Yeah. But cheat code wise, there's the only cheat code is to work your fucking ass off and build your brand up and not try to get him to come to your shop. Like I've seen some shops like make videos like, please come, please come. Or, you know, guys t uh, tag him. He's going to show up. Do you think that motherfucker reads those things? Do you think he's going to even like look at your post to like, cause someone like put the time in to make a post. The dude is what a multimillionaire runs that company. He's all over the place. Like just, Make it as organic as possible. Yeah. Like, let your followers, let your customers reach out. Like, let them, let him see that it's really, like, the pizza's good. Because, yeah. like, you could be an owner that hits him up a thousand times, but if not one of his customers reaches out, maybe that's telling of what the product's really like, and he just wants the clout. Yeah. And I think that's the hardest part is I had... I was really getting fed up at the expo at a certain point, and it was people were always like, how'd you get him to come? How'd you get him to come? How'd you get him to come? And it's like, I didn't do a fucking thing except work my ass off nonstop with my team for a few years at that point. And then we got, well, let's be blunt. We got lucky. He came to Pasadena because so many, here's the thing too. We were just talking about the universe. So many things had to happen for that review to have happened. One, we had to have been open. For, we almost were going to be closed. I decided I'm going to come back and open that day. Two, Michigan had to make the Rose Bowl for him to even come out to Los Angeles because he's a Michigan fan. Yeah. So I have no control over uh, college football and what's going to happen, right? All I know is if he shows up here, I'm going to make good pizza and give it to him. But all those things to get him here, I have no control over. Yeah. I can message him a thousand times. Customers can message him a thousand times. But if Michigan doesn't make the Rose Bowl, he's not coming to California, let alone Pasadena, which is 10 minutes from Glendale. Yeah. So all those factors, like... I hate to say it, there really is no cheat code, but the, the best thing to go with it, that's great. There shouldn't be a cheat code in life. There is no, like, easy way to get anything. But then I think one thing to be prepared for is, like, just be prepared to... Some people want, like, Portnoy to come to their shop, but, like, I really feel, and I've seen this with some shop owners, is, like, I don't know if you really want him to come 
and review your pizza. Because, like, I've seen some of these videos of people all over the country that have gotten him there, and he's like, why the fuck did you tell me to come here? And I see the pizza, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, if you're making conveyor belt dominoes under a different name, do you really want someone to, like, that has eaten the best pizza in the world to review it? Yeah. And that's a, I mean, that's a struggle, man. There's no cheat code. And the same with comedy. There's no cheat code. You can't just do a set one day, and then the next day you're on fucking Jimmy Fallon doing 10 minutes for the, for the world. You yeah. have to put in hard, hard work. And... But we're talking about basically the cheat code for the cheat code because yeah. Portnoy is a cheat code. Oh, 100%. Someone said on this podcast he's a golden ticket. 100%. Because my business has grown 400% since the video dropped. And it's steady. And I am grateful for that. But you also have to deliver on what that video promises, which for us is thin, crispy, well-done pizza, which they featured in that video perfectly. And I'm so grateful that... The, the video shots of it looked great or whatever, but the feedback we got on the video and uh, here's another thing. If you do get the video, don't read the comments. Don't read the comments on anything ever yeah, because I you're going to stay out. Of you're going to lose your like mind. Yeah. And like, gratefully, ours were pretty positive And a lot of them were about me and like my demeanor and like how like just I was n nice and genuine or whatever. But the negative ones were always like peaches burnt, this or that, whatever. <laughs> OK. Sure, it's burnt. Go fucking eat something else. Like, I've been saying that to people that aren't Dave Portnoy for years. Like, it doesn't matter. But, like, the cheat code of the cheat code is, like, if that happens, get ready as soon as he leaves your shop. Like, just get ready to, for the busiest weeks, months, years of your life. I will say this. Freddie the Pizza Man out of Detroit, he got a great review years ago. And he got, like, an 8-7 or something. He reached out to me. Before the video, like right after the video dropped, I don't know this guy. Like, I just admire him and what he does. I admire all these people all over the country. He reached out to me and goes, brother, I'm so happy for you. Just get ready. It's not going to stop for years to come. People still visit me three years later because of that. And you were great in the video and the pizza looks great. And just keep being yourself. And to hear that validation from someone I don't even know but admire from afar makes it like that. It makes it all worth it. Yeah. And like with Portnoy or with anyone, because we got how Kev Eats came a week after Portnoy came and he's a big pizza or food reviewer on TikTok and all that. He came. He loved it, too. And everyone that's come and reviewed it since Knock on Wood has given us a great score because we just make what we make. Like we're proud of what we make. We put time into the details of it. Well, it's interesting, too, because I think. With somebody like Dave Portnoy who comes in and has that much leverage and attraction, like there's no there's no coincidence that like there were, were other people hopping on the Dave Portnoy train. Oh like, yeah, like Kev Eats, like people like there there was influencers flocking left and right to come try the the pie. So it's interesting that when it rains, it pours. Yes, like you know what I mean. It was like you you were fucking what do they call it? Honey on, I don't know. You were basically a fucking beehive, though, and they were swarming. Yes, like and I, it, that I, that review got you even more. And the attention. key is, I bathe in honey now, so it's a lot yes, easier. Yes, you just fucking have a bath. So all the pores in. That was ranch. Honey ranch. Honey that's, ranch. That's the key to honey it. Honey based yeah. ranch. Honey based ranch. It cuts through the the grime of the dill. So yeah. that's what it does. But you, dude, that was a thing I wasn't prepared for. I will say that. Like I knew Portnoy was going to be big, but then all these other people just started coming and showing up, and then. Like, okay, from that, I'm now friends with the creator of Entourage, Doug Ellen, mm -hmm. because now he is a, he loves pizza and he just goes around the shops and tries pizza and like doesn't review them, but just tells more people. And like, that's the thing that, that the Portnoy thing opened up for us and other shops now is that other people go, oh shit, there's like real deal pizza out here. And you could always count on like the LA reviews and all that to be good, but he has a national platform. Yeah. There's no one else doing national pizza reviews with his amount of platform. So he's able to expose you to other people. And now I'm friends with him. We're talking about Louis Lombardi. Like I'm not name dropping. It's just, these are people I used to watch on TV when I was 20 and drunk. And now they're coming to my shop asking me if I can give them a table, like fucking crazy shit. Yeah. You could never even imagine. Yeah. And most nights I just want to get home and fucking lay down with him. Yeah. Cause it's, there is a lot to it and it's just it, the mind blowingness of the effect of it is insane to me. And like now we have the two ovens, we have a full setup, we have our full kitchen, 
We have two walk-ins we use now. We we have more staff. We have a runner. We have everything's grown. Yeah. We have a roof. I, we didn't have a roof before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a full front of house. We have a full like everything got upgraded in three months, and that you'll never see because that's stuff you and me talk about. Yeah. And customers don't see that. That's why I always take it personal when someone knocks us for scaling or, you know, listen, pizza's not perfect. You're going to make a one that's not what they think or whatever. Pizza's so subjective. So now when we make it, it's just like do the best you can. And if someone knocks you, it's okay. It's not a big deal. Yeah, especially when you're when you're doing it on the scale now that you are, you're always you're it's never going to be perfect. You're never. always you're when you're making that many pizzas, there is always more of a chance of something fucking up. And then you also now there is there is hype, which is also something that no one's ever prepared for. You yes. know what I mean? Like That's, you oh. there's there's your, there's your pizza and then there's hype. You know what I mean? And the hype thing is crazy because LA is a hype machine. Yes. Like everything, food, clothes, music, whatever, when hype gets behind it, it's it's a double-edged sword because then people expect something. And when you go into something with expectations, especially food, uh, you're going to be let down most of the time. And not saying like, you know, don't have, don't believe in the hype, but what I realized quickly was people were, some people were expecting it to be a certain way. And then we started getting... Uh, flack for the gas or whatever. And I was like, that's bullshit. Here's the, here's everyone else who does gas, whatever. I don't care about that. And then the hype was like, is it really worth the wait or whatever? And I'm like, our waits are 45 minutes now on a Friday or Saturday. Cause we have two ovens and a bunch of people. Yeah. So like, that's just people just people suck. <laughs> like, let's just be blunt. People suck. And like their time is important, but you can go to Casa Bianca on a Saturday and you're going to wait an hour for a table. Yeah. So like, understand as a customer, like you can understand that the amount of work we put in to get to 45 minutes on a Friday, yeah. you'll never understand how hard that was. Like no one will, you understand that shop owners understand that, but no one will ever understand just to get to that. That was a big, like, like goal for me was to get us to that level 45 to an hour on those busy nights. So we can give deliver on the hype. Yeah. And every day, no matter if any bad thing happens, Bad pizza, we mess something up, whatever. I've learned to calm down with like those things because I'll always get a message or like a picture or someone reaching out that just loved it. And like that's what keeps me going every day. Not validation, but it's like we're affecting someone every day with food. Yeah. And like now that there's a hype behind it, it's actually great because now we don't have to market ourselves and really grind to get ourselves out there as much as we used to. Yeah. But now it's even harder. Now we have to stay up there. Like I'm a big wrestling fan, and last night was uh, WrestleMania 40. And Cody Rhodes, they finally gave him the title. He won. He had a big story for two years. And CM Punk, of all people, was commentating afterwards and said something important. He's like, "It's everyone thinks it's very, very hard to get to the top. But once you're up there, it's even harder to stay up there. Yeah. And I'm not saying we're at the top, but like to get to the Portnoy Review, which is everyone's, a lot of people in Pizza's ultimate goal, and then to stay up there and to keep your quality going and to go further. Yeah. That's the hardest part. Yeah. And that's the stuff that no one sees. That's the stuff when I text you or I'm like, Alex, I need to come by. Are you at the shop? Can I please just hold you? Please just <laughs> please just stroke me for the love of God. <laughs> just just let's hit my bald spot. Please. Just <sighs> like I've I've had a couple mental breakdowns where it was just like I needed to breathe and figure some shit out. Yeah. Well, and, I mean, it's a lot of work to do what you did. I mean, to get an oven in here 48 hours later or 72 hours later or whatever, and it's crazy. Do- triple your staff and you know, a lot, of, not a lot of people could do that. Um, the did, was there any because uh, this is the last question I'll ask about Dave Portnoy. The he is a polarizing character, and there is a lot of people that don't like him, and there is a lot of people that love him, and they they he is their oh, god. Yeah. yeah. Uh, was there any negative feedback that you got because he came in here? Tons, tons. Yeah, like, really? Oh yeah, I, I had uh, a message from someone. Uh, that was like, how dare you let let him come into your shop? And I was like, I responded to this person with, we serve anyone that comes and pays for pizza. Yeah. I've probably served multiple, like, fucking drug dealers, murderers, serial killers, <laughs> fucking politicians, fucking <laughs> bad rappers, bad rock stars, uh, idiots, morons, losers that I don't know about. Yeah. I'm still serving the pizza to him. Yeah. He's another guy who came in and ordered pizza and also paid for it. Yeah. 
So it's like, I just minimize, like, you have to minimize it. Yeah. And like, we got a lot of negative, not a lot, but like, those were the messages I would get. And I don't read the comments of anything anymore. There was always like, fuck him, fuck him, whatever. Yeah. But for us specifically, there was no real attack negative stuff, which I appreciate because him showing up here is just a testament to our hard work and what we were doing. Yeah. And we were in the area. We got very lucky that we were in the area. He even told me, and this was off camera, he was, he flew in, I believe, to Van Nuys and was driving to Pasadena, and Glendale's on the way. He, he literally goes, you're on the way. So I was like, finally, we'll go do you. That, I can't control that. I can't control that he flew into fucking Van Nuys yeah. and just saw that we were on the way. That's incredible. Yeah. So those things, like, we can't control that. So, like, the negative feedback or anything was just that kind of stuff. And then now if we get any negative feedback, it's like, oh, we expected it to be this or that. And the worst thing in restaurants is expectations. You can only do so much yeah. for people's expectations. Yeah. And ours are all over the internet now. And it's, you know, it's a lot to live up to, but it's great now because now it's every day is a challenge in its own way. It's like, yes, we found ways to scale up and make sure the pizza quality is the same every time. But there'll always be there's that rule 80 20, make 80 percent of your customers happy and come back 20 percent. No matter what you do, you don't change anything. They may never come back again. They won't be happy. Yeah. And when you can accept that, you can't make everyone happy. Like you could, I think you could be a like a happy restaurant owner. Yeah. Because like same in comedy, like I never was going to make everybody laugh. I could just make some people laugh great. You know, that's why I'm, I mean, I, I'm an artist. I love, you know, I, I am a horrible bass player. I am covered in tattoos that are silly and dumb. I love, uh, drawing. I love painting. I love doing all this stuff. No one knows about, uh, and I love making pizza. So that's my art form that I made my career. But like in art, no one gives a fuck like what the negative stuff is. Cause you just want to make what you want to make. Yeah. And that's what I did. And that's what we do here. And now we get to do it for a bigger audience, which is incredible. Yeah. Like, it's incredible. And like, well, I'm sh like, like we were talking and I'll just like, I signed a lease for a, a Connecticut that's pizzeria. What was, that's what I was going to get into next. I'm sorry I jumped it, but no, like, good. I'm still like, I went home for a trip and I've always said to myself, I'll never open a pizzeria. And then because I'm a stubborn son of a bitch who has a chip on his shoulder, I go, I'm going to open a pizzeria in Connecticut now. And there is a great opportunity in the East Rock Market, which is right in New Haven. And a spot was there, already built. And they're like, do you want to come in in July? And I thought about it for two days, talked to my business partner, and we signed the lease two days ago. And we're opening up Ozzy's East in, in Connecticut in July. And the response from that has been, I was like, why didn't I wait? Why did I wait this long? Because now it's like having that and having being able to now visit my nephew, who's going to be three. I'm having a niece in July see my family, see my father as he's growing older, like while checking on my spot and my location. If you had told me that my first day of getting sober and making a pizza on my steel in my apartment like years ago, I would have fucking punched you. Like I would have been like, you're fucking crazy. That's not, no, you're, what are you genie man? No, that's ridiculous. Like this shit, it's just, you gotta just like, fuck. You just can't give a shit about failing. You can't give a shit about what anyone really thinks, and because it's their problem. That's another thing I've learned with all these negative reviews that we all get and all that. That's their problem. That has nothing to do with Alex Coons. That has nothing to do with Chris Wallace or Ozzy's or Hot Tongue. Anyone has a bad day, unless you can trickle down and figure out what it was about at the shop, that person was going to write that no matter what experience they got because they needed to have their audience see mm -hmm. it. And that's the same with these influencers and everything. Everyone's going to do whatever they want to do, and that's why I don't butter people up. That's why, you know, you don't pay for reviews. You don't give out free shit. You run your business, right? You have a good time with it. You know where I give free shit to? My friends and my family and my pizza shop friends. Yeah. I give tables to my friends, like, where I can. If I don't know you, I had a guy, I don't know his name. It was some dumb little influencer. He has, like, a 1,000 followers on Instagram. And he was messaging me nonstop for days. Hey, I want to come in and do a pizza. I, I charge 200 bucks. I want to do a pizza, 200 bucks. And I'm like, no. Like, I don't know who you are let alone your platform is uh, tinier than Ozzy's fucking dick. And I'm like, you're going to fucking, uh, you're going to fucking, by the way, you have a big dick, Ozzy. I'm He's sorry. talking about his dog, yeah. by the way, yeah, just so dog. everyone knows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's about Ozzy. Uh, you have a huge dick. I know. I love you, buddy. Um, the kid's like begging me, begging me to come pay for me to pay him to do a pizza review. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, we don't need it. Like, we're doing great. If you want to come by and have a pizza review, feel free. 
That's fine, but we're not going to pay for it. And he goes, okay, I can come in on Tuesday. I'll be there at Tuesday at 11 a.m. I'm like, great, we're closed on Tuesdays. See you then. <laughs> Thank you for verifying that you have no idea about my business yeah. and you're just searching. Yeah. And that, and, and, and that's the, oh, it's so funny that's when that shit happens. Reality. It's the reality of it. It's just fun. Like, I'm a very confident guy in my business, and I'm, but I still have, you know, insecurities about things that I can't control. Yeah. And when those come out, I take a breath. And for me, I call a sponsor. Or I talk to my staff and like, we get through it. Yeah. And like, after all of this is said and done and like, we open Aussies in Connecticut, like we're, we're because of that review, we're looking at opening another one in California now. Mm -hmm. And like, when people say it's a golden ticket, well, you still had to be invited to the chocolate factory. Yeah. Like you still had to be, you know, you still had to drive to get there. You still had to figure out, you had to buy all those chocolate bars to get the ticket. Yeah. Whatever it was. There's always work that goes into it. And I think like to pizza shop owners that are opening or trying to get that, don't make that your goal. Like that was never my goal. My, yeah. my goal was never to have some influencer, whether it was Dave, Kev, uh, anybody, any of these articles. My goal was just to make pizza that I love yeah. and then serve it. Yeah. Everything else afterwards has been gravy. Like it's that's and that's the best part of it. It's like all of this stuff is just icing on that cake, if you want to use that like phrase. Yeah. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if if it was just me at a table with a Gosney making pizza on the side of my street, I would do it. I do it in a heartbeat. I went to you the day that underdogs closed. I remember this. Yeah. I had no clue where Ozzy's was gonna be. And I know. you calmed me down, we chatted. And I was like, I'm going to take a breath. I really, really thought about drinking that night. I really did. And I didn't because I saw you and I talked to friends. And I was like, you know what? No matter what, I can go pop up anywhere. I have those bars we've been going to. I can still do Aussies in any way. And we'll figure it out. Yeah. And the next day, this happened. It was figured out. I know that's a great. I mean, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You're, 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 you were on a rocket ship. Yeah. And, you know, it. I think on the outside, it's, it, it could look like, oh, man, look at all this luck. But I think hopefully everyone listening to this is and i like what you said about you know you had you have to buy all the chocolate bars you had to mm. you, you, it was work to make that happen and then you know charlie gets the chocolate factory you know he inherits that chocolate factory we don't know what happens but i mean <laughs> you know what i mean like but that's a lot of work first and of it, all where's that sequel i want to know what happened to charlie uh, the great glass elevator i never read no. but uh you know like what you've done I love calling Hot Tongue the Chocolate Factory, so I'm going to call Ozzy's the Chocolate Factory. What you <laughs> have done, and, and and how you are growing, and how you continue to grow, uh, I mean, it speaks volumes that like there is no golden ticket. There's only, really, there's only hard work and being prepared to work even harder when these opportunities come. Yeah, and not being afraid to take those opportunities. I never wanted to open a pizzeria in Connecticut. Never. I always said. We would never have a space there. It's oversaturated and everything. And within three months, I, my mindset changed because when I was home and I, it all came about because I was home visiting my nephew and I really loved being there, being the godfather and, you know, playing with this kid and seeing my family. And my family looks at me in a different light now because I always thought I was the black sheep of the family and I was the scapegoat and I was the failure. And that's just how I thought, you know, that was my alcoholic thinking, right? And now I go home and like to see my family, that's, that's there and that the genuine love we have for each other and the support we have, I do miss that. But I love living in California. I love it out here. This is where I always wanted to be since I was probably 10 years old. And so to be able to open up one over there and, and be able to travel now with everything that's going to happen is just is the most beautiful gift of all of this. And the only reason I have one is because my good friend now, Colin Kaplan, who runs Taste of New Haven, uh, it's a popular uh, travel company in New Haven. He wrote and uh, produced the Pizza Love Story documentary about um, New Haven Pizza. I saw him in Pizza Show seven years ago, and he was being interviewed by Frank Pinnell. And then one day he messaged me, hey, your pizza looks good. I was like, thanks. I had no idea it was him. And he goes, hi, I'm Colin. I'm like, are you the guy from the thing? He goes, oh, I, I watch all your stuff. And now we're friends, and we're out to, we're at dinner, we're at two parties in uh, West Haven. We're having dinner. I'm like, let's go. I'm, I'm awake. Let's go have a drink. Let's go hang out. I'm sitting there with my bitters and soda and he's drinking his like Heineken or whatever. And I was just like, I wonder if I should open one in New Haven. And Colin goes, I have three places available right now that I can show you tomorrow. And I was like, 
fuck it. Let's go look at something. And I was flying back here the next day at 12. Mm -hmm. So I literally drove to the place that we just leased, drove to the place with Milton. Milton was there on his own. That's also funny. Milton's on a pizza pilgrimage right now. And yeah. he may never come back. He's just, he's taking over the, the, the East coast right now. And Milton met me over there and our faces just dropped at this opportunity. Yeah. And it's going to be a lot of work. Like it's a, a market that's still up and coming. They're still building around it and the brewery is right next door, but there's still going to be a lot of work because now we're in the belly of the beast. And the best part is Pepe's reached out and said, congratulations. Sally's reached out and said, congratulations. Uh, the shops down the street reached out. Zupardi's reached out and they said, welcome to the neighborhood. If I, I, if I did this years ago and said that, I would have thought they would have been like, what the fuck are you doing? Get the fuck out of here. There's always a space to go if you're just genuine about what you do. And these people, my, my luminaries that I love, like, are like, can't wait for you to be out here. Do you, can you quickly tell us like how you plan on staffing and, and working that operation or are you still figuring that out? Uh, we have like a basic plan, but essentially my business partner, Craig is more than likely going to be moving home to run it. Yeah. And he has a huge support system with his family and friends out there as do I. Uh, we also have um, possibly one of our employees is moving out there as well. I won't say who or yet cause it's not concrete, Yeah. but two people that started here are more than likely going to be running that one. Um, ironically on the plane ride back, I'm on JetBlue and I fly JetBlue all the time. You know, when the, they walk by the aisle, hey, you should apply for the JetBlue frequent flyer card at this rate, blah, blah, blah. And I always go, no, I'm watching a shitty movie. This time they're like 70,000 free travel miles. If you sign up today and get approved, I'm like, I'll take that. And I literally on my phone, I applied and I actually got it. And I was like, so now I have like eight free trips to fly back home. So then I signed the lease the next day knowing I can fly back. A lot. So my goal is to travel like every couple months to check on it. I'll be there for grand opening. Yeah. But what's great is I have that support system. I have some feelers out for front of house manager and it's a smaller setup. It's essentially a food stall inside of a market. So like sort of a food court setup. Yeah. So smaller volume. And I, I already told the, the my partner about what we would do. Just focus on that, you know, focus on the volume you can do at first and we'll see how it grows. Yeah. And that's what we did here. Like, yeah, we'll have a big push probably when we open, but that's their plan right now. And plans change. You know that. Like, yeah. who knows? But at the end of the day, it, it, we had we couldn't say no. The deal's too good. The rent deal was too good. And we want to help. The landlord wants to help us. My sign's already being made there. Like, it's it, we're so excited to do it yeah. that it, it's, again, I, I'm not afraid to fail. Yeah. And if it does, I have no, we'll see, you know? Yeah. But that's the plan right now. I'm going to, this is home base, LA's home base. And I'll travel as much as I need to, but yeah, it's uh, it's kind of crazy to think about that, and just like realize that like people are like, "How are you gonna do?" A lot of my friends are, like, "You're moving home." I'm like, "No, I don't like the cold. I'm not moving home." To wrap this up, I think that you have one of the craziest years in maybe pizza I've I've ever witnessed, and I think you deserve every drop of it. When you texted me about uh, signing the lease or whatever, I said. Uh, you deserve the world yeah. and, and you'll have it. And I truly believe that you have been a great friend and uh, it's been inspiring to watch, man. Well, I love you. You know, uh, I do. And I appreciate everything you've done for LA pizza and continue to do. And I will keep telling customers to go to hot tongue and get your food all the time. I appreciate that. Cause you are the dough scientist of Los Angeles. Barely graduated high school, but I can write I can write a dough formula for sure. Hey, man. At the end of the day, uh, what would we say? Uh, Ozzy may have a small dick, but he's a great dog. So, <laughs> there you All go. All right, I got one final question, dude. <laughs> and because you are the only, the first, uh, the first guest to come on twice, I had to think of how, Ooh, what, really? what question. Nice. Yeah, we've never had, nice. you are the first person to, to grace the podcast again. Uh, well, thank you for that. That's yeah, awesome. Well, uh, th thanks for making the time. The who knows? Maybe the fucking next time we talk to you, we'll be in Connecticut. Done deal. <laughs> You'll be in Milton's uh, uh, mansion. Yeah. Uh, who is the best live performer of all time that I've seen, or that, just I assume? Well, I w I didn't know if I should say. I think it should be that you've seen. What's well, like the best live show you've ever seen? That's a. That's a very good question. I would say the best concert I've ever been to in my life 
give me three seconds because I've been to a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I mean, take your time. I mean, I'll just say real quickly, I saw Jimmy World and Fall Out Boy like a month ago, and they were incredible. Like, they, like Jimmy World was tight. Fall Out Boy sucked when I saw them 20 years ago. They yeah. fucking sucked life. <laughs> and they were so tight this time. I was just like, wow, like, good for them. They but probably like, all stopped drinking. Yeah, I, I will say probably my favorite performance I've ever seen in my life that was, like, just tight and beautiful was it's it's a toss up between Rush, Van Halen with David Lee Roth and Metallica. I got to see all three of them at different moments, but I th- uh, yeah, I'd, I Metallica blew me away. I mean, they were my favorite band growing up. I still love them. Yeah, and I got tickets to the San Diego show that happened like six seven years ago. Yeah, and we we're on the floor, and I was right by the stage, and to watch like every song that I've ever seen. And they were so tight and so good. And there's a billion other bands I've seen. Like I'm seeing between the bear and me tonight. And they're one of my favorite metal bands of all time. I saw them in a 50 seat room once in Connecticut for like 10 bucks. And like they tore the place down. Like I love music. And now that I play bass, it's fun. I have that little connection to it. Yeah. I am not good at all, but it's fun to be able to like, see how hard it is to do that stuff. Yeah. But yeah, that Metallica show in San Diego was incredible. My favorite show of all time. Still to this day, though, can I just, I'll just say this was my first concert I ever got to go to, which was a radio festival show in Connecticut. And I'll, if anyone gets the reference from my Connecticut people, they'll know Radio 104 Fest. And it was headlined by Blink-182. And Blink played, Newfound Glory played, Sum 41 played, Alien Ant Farm played, Good Charlotte played, all these bands. Damn, that, that's like, a festival right yeah. there. And like I was a, a 12-year-old kid, so insecure. And my uncle took me, who was a guitar player. And for the first time in my life, I felt like I belonged somewhere. Yeah. And so that that would be my favorite concert I've ever been to, like, period. Yeah. And then tightest act I've ever seen was Metallica, like, hands down. But you just said that you did see Van Halen with David Lee Roth. Yeah. How old were you when you saw that? They, they, they came around in Connecticut, like, 10 years ago. Oh, even funnier, I when I first moved here, I won tickets to their, their performance at Jimmy Kimmel Live. And they performed the, the scary one where like yeah. it was just like what the fuck yeah when they just got back together yep. for like the first time yep so that, they were on Hollywood a, Boulevard everyone should watch that because that is hard to get through what's even funnier is they're on Hollywood Boulevard and we waited eight hours to get let in for the yeah. show in the sun on Hollywood Boulevard you couldn't drink do anything in the line we get up there we're right front row. David Lee Roth starts the first song and flings the microphone into his fucking nose yeah and breaks his nose and we're like what the fuck's going on. This is crazy. He comes back. He's like, Zippity Bob got a bandaid. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> like, they cut into he it. He looked fucking crazy, dude. Dude, he looked insane. Yeah. And it was just like, I'm watching this. I'm like, this is not the, the band I saw a few years back. Because they had they went on tour when he first came back. Yeah. And that was a really tight show. Like, his son, Eddie's son played and all that. Yeah. And then to think, like, I got to see them play before he died is really awesome. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many artists I've been able to see over the years. I've always been a music nerd. And yeah. like, what's yours? I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna turn table, table turn. Oh my god! What is your favorite best live performance? Yeah. Uh, well, I gotta say, I mean, Dave Matthews really takes the cake for live performance. But I will say, I saw Blink 182 when they toured with Jimmy Eat World and Newfound Glory, <sighs> and that was one of the best shows I've ever seen. If you've ever been to the Gorge. It's literally, there's a gorge in Washington, and the sun usually sets when the headliner gets out. It's all outdoors. That's awesome. And that was the tour. I forget what album, but when, like, the devil would talk to to Mark and Tom. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And, like, it was just, like. I went to that tour, too. I went with an ex-girlfriend that I cheated on my girlfriend with uh, in the back of a truck. It was just really memorable. Yeah. I was a great guy in high school. Yeah. <laughs> He's 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 still a great guy, guys. <laughs> Alex Coons, great guy. If you're gonna cheat on your girlfriend, back I of think, a truck, yeah, at a Blink One Eighty Two yeah. show. I feel like there was some Everclear and vodka involved in that one. It was Captain Morgan's. There we go. Yeah, that a boy. Yeah, but that I think it, I think that was one of the best live performances. And you know what? I, seeing Blink again. Yeah. Uh, during their last show or their last uh, reunion tour. I was just fucking blown away of how good they are live and how good that new album is. Oh, the new album is incredible. I listen to it almost every, like once a week. Yeah. It's really inspiring. And then th- I'll end it with this. I got to meet Mark at the Chain Fest like, I saw a few that. months ago. And that was right the month that I quit my job. And I was like, should I do this? And I'm not going to, a person in my life's going through cancer treatment right now. 
And it's the same type of cancer that Mark had, the lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And I was literally, I texted my friend that album and the video of them being interviewed about his cancer that day. And I walk into Chain Fest and Mark Hoppus walks in, but with like his wife. And I walk over to him, like we were talking about earlier. I walk over to him like, dude, what's up? Uh, I've listened to you forever. I have your, I have the blink smiley tattooed on my arm. I love you guys. Uh, my friend's going through what you're going through. Just, I love the album. Congrats that you're healthy. And he's like, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. I'm like, we got to take a photo. He goes, absolutely. And he just, that was it. I was like, I'll see you in the pit in July because I'm going to the show in July. Yeah. And he was like, awesome. I was, yeah, thanks. And I left him alone. Yeah. Because like, I'm a moments guy. Like, if I just have a good moment with people, like a moment will last forever in someone's mind, right? I don't need to talk to Mark. I'm like, you got to come to my pizzeria. You got to do this and that. It's like, no. Like, uh, people were like, why don't you tell him? I'm like, no, it's not about that. And then I text my, my friend who's going through cancer. I'm like, dude, you're not going to die. This is like, I just met Mark. Like, the world's on your side. Yeah. Like, those are the things I look at, and I'm like, you can't control that shit. Yeah. And then I bought a bass the next day, and I've learned, like, six songs by Blink since then. Because I was just like, why not? There's no reason to fail. Just go for it. And that's where we end it. I'm a moments guy. There's no reason to fail. Just go for it. Chris? Alex? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>